after the capture of four of the five secret G-weapons of the Alliance, Zaft quickly went to work reverse engineering their technology and incorporating it into their own mobile suits. At first, this would result into the mass-produced Gwaze, which would then be further developed into the Dreadnought Gundam, a unit that can be considered as the father of all of Zaft's Gundams, because not only would the unit itself be further developed, but it would also give rise to the X-09A Justice, the X-10A Freedom, the X-11A Regenerate, the X-12A Testament, and today's subject, the X-13A Providence. A unit that would eventually become one of the most advanced Gundams of the First Bloody Valentine War, and according to one source, the most powerful unit of the war period. But the Providence Gundam's design actually began as a much more simple and basic mobile suit. Originally, it was designed as a close combat unit with heavy armor and four large beam sabers. But then, when its mainframe was already completed, Raoul Le Creuset was assigned as the machine's main pilot. A man who was famous and infamous for a lot of things, but the one relevant thing for the Providence Gundam was that he had high spatial awareness and could therefore use Zaft's brand new Dragoon system that was first tested out on the aforementioned Dreadnought Gundam. This Dragoon system, or Disconnected Rapid Armament Group Overlook Operation Network system, was essentially Zaft's version of the Alliance's gun barrel system, but instead of having to rely on wires, the Dragoon system was controlled wirelessly through quantum communication. And while this did also give the Dragoons much more agility, the big downside was that it was an incredibly power-hungry system. So much so that it could only be used by mobile suits with a nuclear engine, which the Providence Gundam just so happened to have, along with an end jammer canceller. And so the decision was made to convert the Providence Gundam into a Dragoon-equipped mobile suit on the fly. For the most part, this quick conversion went fine, but some compromises had to be made. An example of this were the six now iconic looking cables that ran from the machine's torso to the Dragoon equipped backpack. Because the mainframe was already completed, there was simply no room to install them on the inside. And then to prevent them from becoming an Achilles heel, they were protected by the phase shift armor, just like the rest of the mobile suit. And thanks to that aforementioned nuclear reactor, it could stay on almost indefinitely. What these cables were for exactly is up in the air, with many sources disagreeing with each other. The Gunpla manuals and some other sources state that they're quantum communication cables, the Gundam Seed mobile suit encyclopedia says that they're energy cables, and yet other publications, they play it safe and just call them cables. And then we have the Japanese Wikipedia page that says that out of the six cables, two are quantum communication cables and four are energy cables. And while I do think that this interpretation makes a lot of sense, with two cables going into the cockpit and four cables making their way into the chest, I couldn't actually find where they got this claim. It's thrown into a compound sentence, whose source is the high grades manual, which simply says that they're quantum communication cables. The closest thing to this theory that I was able to find was in the 105th Gundam fact file. Here they call the cables quantum communication cables in one blurb, but in another text blurb they say that some of the cables connect to the power source in the torso, which sounds less like quantum communication cables and more like energy cables. So. Long story very short, you can decide for yourself what they are exactly. Another downside of this ad hoc conversion was that the added bulk of the new skirt armor and the backpack 
had a serious impact on the mobility of the Providence. This was somewhat remedied by installing various high-performance thrusters on the backpack and the legs, but it remained at a disadvantage in close combat when compared to its sister units, the Freedom Gundam and the Justice Gundam. However, this was considered as an acceptable trade-off, because with the arsenal that this thing was packing, it should have theoretically been impossible for an enemy mobile suit to get within beam saber range anyways. Which, I'm assuming, is also why the originally four planned beam sabers were reduced to one large beam saber that was now incorporated into the MAMV 05A composite arm shield system. A buckler esque shield that went over the hand and also had two beam guns. It was an evolution of the Guazes MAMV 03 and actually leaned somewhat closer to the Blitz's Trickeros offensive shield system that they were both based on. But back to the Dragoon system. It consisted of three large pots with nine beam guns each and eight smaller pots with two beam guns each for a grand total of 43 beam guns. And to make matters even worse for anyone trying to go up against the Providence, these 43 guns were also linked to the multi-lock-on system, a specialized system in Zaft's Gundams that allows their machines to lock on to multiple targets with deadly precision. And just for good measure, the Providence also has four, or according to some sources only two, MMI Gao 2 Picus 76mm Seawiz guns and the massive MAM-221 Eudicium beam rifle. This gun was essentially an upgraded version of the Dreadnought's already big beam rifle, with some parts from the Justice and Freedom's beam rifle. The result was a difficult to handle beam rifle that was almost as big as a mobile suit itself, but its power output was equally high, often being cited as one of the most powerful beam rifles around. Also, Due to its size, it's designed to be used over the shoulder and also has a secondary handle. And as if all of these weapons weren't enough, as a Zavd Gundam with the multi-lock-on system, it is supposedly also compatible with the Meteors. But don't quote me on this because I didn't see this mentioned in any official sources. And on top of that, I'm also fairly certain that this only went for the original design of the Providence because I don't think it still fits with that massive backpack. And unlike the Justice and the Freedom Gundams, it doesn't move out of the way. But whether it came with a meter unit or not, this still wasn't the machine you'd want stolen. If only they'd used NordVPN with the link down below or the code KKRT. Then they would have gotten a great discount on extra security online and the ability to dodge those pesky region locks. But despite this minor setback, the Providence Gundam would continue to be influential in Zaft's future mobile suit design. After the war, the Junius Treaty was signed, which, among many other stipulations, banned the use of end jammer cancelers for military purposes and limited the amount of ships, mobile armors and mobile suits that each side could have proportional to their national resources. Something that put the plants at an enormous disadvantage versus the Atlantic Federation, meaning that they would once again have to rely on quality versus quantity. So, in a way to somewhat circumvent these regulations, Zaft would no longer focus on role-specific mobile suits and would instead copy the Striker packs of the Strike Gundam. Twice. There was the Impulse Gundam with the Silhouette packs and the Zaku series with the Wizard packs. But despite a few minor differences, both of these new systems were functionally identical to each other 
and also almost identical to the Alliance of Striker packs that they were based on. So much so that there were even mobile suits out there that could use both Striker packs and Wizard packs. But that's a story for another time. The important thing is that these exchangeable packs allowed for a single mobile suit to perform a variety of roles, while still having it count as only one machine for the Junius Treaty. So of course, Zaft had a very good reason to experiment with a variety of packs, and at one point it was even considered to turn the Dragoon system of the Providence Gundam into a pack as well. But unlike the other packs, it was determined that this one would be better as a purpose-built mobile suit. And while they don't give an official reason, I think it most likely had to do with the quantum communication system that was needed to efficiently run these things. So instead of a wizard pack, it became the brand new ZGMF X3000Q Providence Zaku, complete with a new set of tubes. On the original Zaku Warrior, these housed an active protection system against guided missiles, but on the Providence Zaku, they had quantum receivers for the Dragoon system and coolant for the nuclear engine. And thanks to advancements in technology, this Dragoon system no longer needed a pilot with high spatial awareness, a trait that is exceedingly rare even amongst coordinators. Oh, and you might have caught on to the fact that I said that they had cooling for the nuclear reactor, even though I said that they were banned by the Junius Treaty. Well, it's only illegal when you get caught, so in order to prevent them from getting caught, they didn't put the nuclear suffix A in its model number. And also to be fair to Zaft, they probably assumed, and rightfully so, that as soon as war broke out again, the Alliance wouldn't hesitate to start flinging around their nukes again. Which they did. And then immediately got wiped out. Oh, and the Provident Zaku doesn't just use any old nuclear engine either. It uses the Hyper Deuterion engine, which is like a combination of a nuclear engine with the Deuterion Beam Energy Transfer System that was first tested out by the Impulse Gundam. Or, in short, it meant that the still very power hungry Dragoon system would never run out of juice, which is probably the second reason that they decided not to turn it into a mere wizard pack. The one area where this new Dragoon system fell a bit short though was in raw firepower, coming with only a total of 26 beam guns versus the 43 of the original. But in its place, they now had close combat capabilities. It came with 8 GDU X4 mobile beam assault cannons with 2 guns each, and a sharp edge for ramming attacks, and 2 GDU X7 mobile beam assault cannons. These bad boys come with 5 beam cannons each, and also 4 beam spikes for stabbing purposes. And the modifications to the Zaku wouldn't just be limited to the Dragoon system either. Taking some design cues from the Providence, it got quite the overhaul. The lower legs were slightly different, the skirt armor was completely new, the chest armor was changed to accommodate the Dragoon system and the nuclear powered engine, the head got two new antennas, which I'm assuming were also for the Dragoon system, and the shoulders got extra armor with three sets of thrusters which could also be folded down to be outfitted with the standard Zaku shoulder shields. While this did no doubt decrease its agility, it did give it access to two MAM-8 beam tomahawks and four spare magazines for its brand new MA Bar 790 high energy beam rifle. And unlike many other beam rifles of the time, it was powered by two magazines and when not in use, it could be stored on the backpack. Zaft initially had so much faith in this new design that it received 
3000 and its model number, marking it as the next mass production mobile suit after the 1000 Zaku and the 2000 Goof. But unfortunately, it wasn't meant to be, and the data gathered by the prototype Provident Zaku would instead be used to produce one of Zaft's next generation Gundams, the ZGMF X666S Legend Gundam. And supposedly the name was changed because of the negative connotation that Providence had received thanks to the actions of Le Creuset. The design though wasn't actually changed as much as you might expect, with some parts like the lower legs and the skirt armor being almost identical, and other parts like the arms and the dragoon system being only slightly overhauled. And the biggest change with that Dragoon system were the GDU X4 Dragoon pods being upgraded to the GDU X5 Dragoon pods. They no longer had the sharp edge for physical attacks, but I'm assuming that loss was offset by an overall higher performance, and I also can't imagine that ramming into things was good for the delicate hardware inside. The GDU X7 Dragoons then remained the same, and the backpack looks like it only had a few minor touch-ups, but that could also be down to like inconsistencies or lost detail in the line art. It also had a very useful feature that I haven't mentioned yet. In the original Providence Gundam, the two small Dragoon pods on the backpack were on a hinge, which allowed them to flip forwards or backwards so that they could also be fired without the need to be launched. And for the Provident Zaku and the Legend Gundam, this idea was improved upon. It now had six small Dragoon paws on hinges, and the entire backpack could also move, giving them coverage of almost the entire machine without the need to launch. And not only did this give these machines extra options in combat, but it also made the Dragoons useful in combat on Earth, because the Dragoons could only fly in space. And to complete its arsenal of weapons, it had a pair of MMI GAU 26 17.5mm Seawiz guns mounted in its head, a pair of MAM80S Defiant Kai beam javelins stored in its legs, which were basically beam sabers that could either be used individually or combined into a form known as the Ambidextrous Halbert, and it got an upgraded version of the Provident Zaku's beam rifle, the MA Bar 78F high energy beam rifle. It looked similar, but it had an important change. Instead of being powered by two magazines, it now got its power directly from the unit's hyperdeterian engine. Meaning that it had a higher output, higher rate of fire, and also near infinite ammo. And when not in use, it could still be stored on the backpack. But perhaps the biggest difference with the Provident Zaku lay in its defensive capabilities. It was outfitted with the variable phase shift armor, rendering it impervious to physical attacks, and on each arm it had a Solidus Fulgor beam shield generator, which was capable of blocking almost everything, as long as it had energy, which it got from the nuclear engine and it was speculated that this was a development from the Hyperion Gundam shield, which was made possible by several Eurasian Federation scientists who had defected to Zaft. But whatever the case might be, all of this made the Legend Gundam a truly legendary Gundam. It had superb offensive capabilities, superb defensive capabilities, and unlike the Providence Gundam before it, it didn't have to sacrifice any of its mobility in order to achieve it. It far surpassed the second stage mobile suits like the Impulse, and it was actually a third stage mobile suit, but was still officially classified as a second stage mobile suit for secrecy. You know, nuclear engine and whatnot. 
Originally, this machine was going to be piloted by Athran Zala, but around the time that he was given this assignment, suspicions arose that he might defect, which he eventually did, leading to Ray Zalborel becoming its pilot instead. And based on how the leader of the plant at that time reacted to this news, I think this might have been the plan all along. Athran had a history of going to the other side, and Ray was fiercely loyal to Durandal. And I mean, you wouldn't want to give a machine like this to someone who would end up betraying you again, right? Third time's the charm. And we end this video with a variation of the original Providence, the LN ZGMF X13A Nix Providence Gundam. A very non symmetrical variant that was built by Librarian Works. But there was a method to the madness with two major improvements over the original. The first, and the most important one, was improving the Dragoon system. This was achieved thanks to a new and more powerful quantum communication antenna, and also by significantly rearranging the layout of the individual Dragoons. The two Dragoons on the back skirt remained the same, but everything else was moved around. The four Dragoons on the side skirt, alongside with the composite shield, were now moved to the new left shoulder armor. In the place of the old side skirts then came two new ones that could hold two of the big Dragoon pods, and the backpack has been moved to the new left shoulder, and has been slightly modified to look like a snowflake, which is also the namesake of the machine. Nyx, or snow in Latin with the extra meaning being that the Dragoons themselves would move and attack like a snowstorm. And instead of that giant backpack then, it now has Striker Pack compatibility, a feature that was also found in all other Librarian Works kit bashes. And the Striker Pack meant for the Nyx was the Dragoon Striker. Basically a combination of the Udicium beam rifle with the old shoulder armor that could now act as a 12th Dragoon pod. And what was also really cool about this Dragoon Striker was that you could replace the Udicium with any other gun, or in case of emergency, it could still be used as a handheld weapon. And of course, because it was a Striker pack, it could also be used by other Striker pack compatible mobile suits. However, it does seem that unlike the later upgraded Dragoon systems, this one did still require a pilot with high spatial awareness, so you could say that this was somewhat of an in-between. Also, another reason for rearranging the Dragoons was so that they would be more spread out. On the original Providence, taking out the backpack alone would take out 31 of its 43 Dragoon based beam guns. On the Nyx, this was minimized. And another upgrade that it got that was also made to all other Librarian Works machines was upgraded joints for better close combat capabilities. Unfortunately for the Nyx though, the new Dragoon layout made the machine very unbalanced and therefore very unsuitable for close range combat. But with the upgraded Dragoon system, this wasn't really seen as an issue. The Nyx was meant as a long range support unit anyways. And this intention to only use it as a long range unit was also expressed by keeping the exposed cables that ran from the main body to the backpack. Because thanks to the upgraded Dragoon system, they were no longer needed, but I guess they just liked having them around to make a statement. Uh, the other reason as to why they kept them was apparently because they were iconic. As for its other weapons then, despite being meant for long range, the composite armed shield system that was now mounted onto the left shoulder could still be used in case of emergency, 
and it also kept the four Seawiz guns of the original, but only the two on the body were loaded, because the two in the head could potentially damage the new and delicate quantum communication system. And as a closing note then, the Ellen in its model number stands for Librarian Nix. And that has been all for the Providence Gundam's development history, for now. Because with the Gundam Seed Freedom movie around the corner, we might just get a new variant. So don't forget to check out NordVPN with the link down below or the code KKRT. As always, a big thank you to the Patreon supporters. I hope everyone watching has a great day, and I'll see you all next time.